we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. What a wonderful day it will be when we stand before him and we see him physically the first time in our life. We see him spiritually when we read the Bible. We, we know him, but we have never seen him face to face. He said, no man can see my face and live. But someday we will see his face. We will stand in his presence and we will be able to look on the face of him who loved us and who gave himself for us. I want to see Jesus, don't you? I want to look in his face. I want to thank him. Jesus, Lord, thank you for saving my soul. Thank you, Lord, for making me whole. Thank you, Lord, for giving to me thy great salvation so rich and free. I want to thank you, and I want to see him. Amen? Amen. And then it also has a future tense, and that's concerning the resurrection of the body. The resurrection of the body is part of the adoption. Notice Romans 8, 19. For the earnest expectation of the creature waited for the manifestation of the sons of God. Romans 8, 19 and 8, 23. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves, grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit, he explains, the redemption of our body. Someday I'm going to have a new body. I've got a body today that's 90 years old. But someday I'm going to have a new body. There'll be no aches and pains. Everything will work properly. Someday I'll be able to be strong and I'll be able to run. I'll be able to do whatever I'd like to do. I will have a new body. A body that will never be sick again. A body that will never ache again. A body that will never let me down again. I'll have a body that is new and real and it'll be like his body. That's what Philippians chapter 3, I believe it is, tells us. A new body. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. It shall not appear what we shall be. And that will be a body that will never die again. It will never die again. Once Jesus raises these bodies from the grave, they will never die again. You're going to live on and on and on and on for all eternity. And your body will never get weak. It will never get sick. It will never die. Now, brethren, if you ask me, that's pretty good doctrine. I, I like that idea. It does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when He shall appear, we shall be like Him. For we shall see Him as He is. That doesn't mean we're going to all to look just like Him. You're going to look like you look now, only you'll look a lot better than you do now. You let us give up all those creams and ointments and all those things, and, and you won't need them anymore because you'll be beautiful in God's sight. And uh, you'll have a new body. It'll never get sick. It'll never die. Who shall change our vile body that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body. That's Philippians chapter 3 verse 20 and 21. For our conversation or our manner of life is in heaven from whence we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And he is coming. There are a people living on this earth that will never die. They'll be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. We call that the rapture. The rapture of the saints. In an instant, the twinkling of an eye, they'll be caught up without ever dying into His presence. And then the great tribulation period will begin and the judgment of God will fall upon this earth. But we won't be here to see it. We'll be with Him in glory. Wonderful is the resurrection I have parents not waiting for the resurrection to see them walk out of their graves. I have loved ones that have passed on. I have friends, all of my dear preacher friends have gone on before me. I'm about the only one left. I'm the last of the Mohicans. And all my seminary brethren and students, 
have gone on before me. I'm the last one, I believe, of all of them. And uh, I just don't have time to die. I've got to keep working. I have things to do. <laughs> but one of these days, he'll call me home. And what a glorious hope that is. And his time, we do not know. We all live by his time, not by our schedule. But it's wonderful to know that he empowers you, he strengthens you, and he helps you because he's with us. And there is a witness to adoption in Romans 8, 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Can you sing experimentally? He walks with me and he talks with me. He leadeth me. Does God lead you or do you just decide on your own what you're going to do? Or do you let him lead you? As many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. And what does he lead men to do? He leads men to trust in Jesus Christ. He leads men to worship the Lord. He leads men to go to church. He leads men to read the Bible. He leads men to pray. He leadeth me, O oh, blessed thought, O oh, word with heavenly comfort fraught. He leadeth me. I'm a child of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. That means our Father. It's like a baby lisping the words, Papa. He's our Papa. He's our Father. He is our God. And then the Bible says the Spirit itself, and the Word is Himself, bear witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with Him, that we may be glorified together. Now there are three separate spheres. There's the kingdom of God, there's the family of God, there's the church of God. We are born into the kingdom of God. Read John chapter 3. We are adopted into the family of God. We just read that out of the Bible this morning. And we are baptized into the church of God. I'm speaking of a church just like this. Now the sonship of our Lord is not the same as ours. Christ is the only begotten Son of God. He was never adopted. When you hear people preaching that Jesus was adopted, you know that they don't know the Lord. They're, they're a cult. Jesus was never adopted. He has always been the Son of God. He is eternal. Micah 5, 2. He is eternal. He has always been. He never had a beginning. He's the Alpha and the Omega. Alpha is the first Greek letter and Omega is the last Greek letter. He's the Alpha and the Omega and He's everything in between. And He never had a beginning. He will never have an ending. It's important to distinguish His Sonship from ours. He prayed to His Father and His Father is our Father. But we do not have deity. We are not God. There was a man who had a radio program called Paul Crouch. He called it TBN or something like that. And he was espousing the heretical notion that he can become a God. And he went up and down the country preaching, I'm a little God. I'm a little God. I'm a little God. No, he's a little off in the head. He's not a little God. He's a little off. Because there's only one God, one triune God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We are the children of God. Now, we're not gods. The Mormon church teaches you can become a God by all this hocus pocus that they have. But we are adopted into the family of God. That's how we got in. God has something to say about this. Theologically, this word is apotheosis. And that's a mental aberration when a person thinks or imagines that he's God. 
And evidently this fellow was afflicted with that. He went around saying, I'm a little God. I'm a little God. Now we have the new nature in us. We have the spirit dwelling in us. And we're redeemed. But we are not God. Now, what does God do for us in the remaining time? On the human side, as sons, we have the family name. Ephesians 3.14, For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. 1 John 3, 1, Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew Him not. Secondly, as sons we have the family likeness. But we all with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. What is God doing with you? As a child of God, He is conforming you to the image of His Son. Someday we're going to be like Jesus, the Bible says. In what way? In spiritual ways. We're not going to look just like Jesus. But we're going to think like Jesus. We're going to worship the Father like Jesus did. We're going to obey the Father like Jesus did. We're going to serve the Lord. We're going to be like Him and we are being, we are being developed and maturated each day to be like Jesus. Now i got a long ways to go before I'll be just like Jesus. I, I'm, I'm a lot further along down the road than I was when He saved me. But I still have a long way to go, don't you brethren? Don't you feel that you've got a long way to go yet before you're like Jesus? Uh, I, I do. Uh, I'm, I'm not sinless, but I'm redeemed, forgiven, and saved. I'm not perfect, but someday I will be perfect, and I look forward to that day. Then as sons, we have the parents' nature. As many as received Him, to them gave you power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on His name, which were born, not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, man can't will himself into salvation, nor the will of man, but of God. Born of God. That's the nature of God. He puts His divine nature in us. That doesn't deify us, it doesn't make us God, but it gives us a holy, sinless nature. And as long as we walk in the power of that new nature, then we don't sin. But the warfare between the old nature and the new nature goes on day after day. So we have a nature. When the Lord saved me, He changed my nature. And the old nature is still there. I'd like to get rid of it. I wish I could pull it out and throw it away, but I cannot. Uh, Paul Rader, a great preacher, said one time, uh, that old nature in the Christian is like a dead cat. He said, I just wish I could take it by the tail, yank it out of there, and throw it away. And another preacher said to him, well, brother, have you ever considered the fact that a dead cat has nine lives? And he'll be back tomorrow. <laughs> That's the old nature in us. As his children, we have the fatherly comfort. Verse 2 Corinthians 1 4. Blessed be the God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, and the God of all comfort, who comfort us in all of our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them that are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. God is our comforter. The Holy Spirit is the paraclete that lives within us. And He comforts us. When my dear wife passed away almost 20 years ago, had it not been for the comfort that the Holy Spirit imparted to my heart, 
I could not have gone on. We had a love affair 52 years of marriage. One day God saw fit to take her home to be with himself. Left me down here by myself. But you know, he brought to my mind the fact that he would be with me. He would take her place. And I can really sing now. He walks with me and he talks with me. He tells me I am his own. And the joy I share as we tarry there, none other has ever known. All oh, the comfort that he can give. When I buried my mother, and then when I buried my father, he gave comfort. He is the God of all comfort. And then as his children, we are subjects of his fatherly care. Consider the lilies, Jesus said, how they grow. They toil not, they spin not. Yet I say unto you that Solomon in all his glory was never arrayed like one of these. Solomon was the most glorious king of all the kings. He was arrayed in pomp and splendor and wore threads of gold on his garments. But there's never been a king like Jesus. Jesus is King of kings and Lord of lords. And he in all his glory, someday we will see. If God so clothe the grass, which is today in the field and tomorrow is cast in the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O ye of little faith? His fatherly care in all the years I've been preaching, 65 years I've been in the pulpit, He has never failed to take care of me in whatever need I